Welcome to the NC Choices webinar series, Teaching Tools for Beginning Farmers, funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. I am Matt LaRue, Agricultural Marketing Specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension, and I'm going to present the module on Marketing and Pricing. This is one of seven modules offered in this webinar series. In this presentation, we'll talk about understanding consumers. If you are interested in other resources offered by NC Choices, you can find out more on our website or on our YouTube channel. Okay, this is the second part of profitable meat marketing, uh, a, a section where we focus on understanding your consumer and work on some market research. Again, just to remind uh, people, or if you haven't seen our other slideshows that we're doing, uh, this is a basic four section marketing plan that I advocate for small farms and, and farms that are doing a lot of direct to consumer marketing. Um, today, we're going to talk about the second part of the plan, the market research part, where we'll talk more about um, sales project. Well, no, scrap that. This, yep. This is the second part uh, of the plan, the market research part. We're going to talk about understanding the size of the market and the consumer demands, since in the first section we chose which type of consumer we're going to focus on. So I have a fun way to get this rolling, and that is to imagine uh, that you're on a long car ride, you know, a really long road trip. You've been driving all day, and you really need a good night's sleep. And... Um, you need, you know, you need your rest for the next day. This is going to be a big day, and you're feeling, you know, tired and sore, and you're driving through the night. And now you see this sign, this beacon in the distance that says hotel, and you just can't wait to get a good night's sleep. So you pull off and you check in, and you get to the room, and the room's clean and, and very nice, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so you you get ready and you, you lay down to go to sleep in, in bed and um, after laying and, and kind of tossing and turning for a few minutes you realize that you can't sleep because this mattress is just as, as hard as a sheet of plywood it's just really really hard so you're not going to get any rest so you head down to the front desk and you see the uh, manager and you say oh you know this this bed is really really hard and i i cannot get to sleep um you know what what can we do and the manager says well i'm so glad that you asked because um and they hand you a brochure and, it, and they say we wanted you to know that very hard mattresses are scientifically proven to be better for you in fact they go on and they say hard mattresses align your spine for better health and that people who sleep on very hard mattresses live an average of five years longer. They earn more money at their jobs. This has all been scientifically proven now. They have lower cholesterol, more energy, and fewer children. So now, you know, you've been told, in fact, that this is the best mattress for you. Uh, and now you can head back to your room and have a great night of sleep, right? Well, really, what would you choose for this $120 that you're spending? Would you go back and sleep on the plywood happily, having learned that it's better for you, or right across the road, it turns out, is uh, another hotel with really cushy, comfortable beds for an extra $20 a night. So what would you choose? Well, the, 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 the point that we're illustrating with these, and I, I hope that was amusing and fun, um, is that as marketers, we need to understand the consumer. And in fact, understanding the consumer is much better than educating the consumer, right? So you could have been um, educated on all the benefits of a hard mattress, but you still don't want to sleep on one. And that's sort of the point of that little exercise is that we need to understand the consumer to serve them better rather than trying to educate or convince them because educating consumers is expensive. It takes a lot of time and it's inefficient. And as small businesses and small farms, we can't really afford to take that on. And just to go back to the definition that we introduced in the last section, the definition for marketing is that it's understanding what the customer wants, developing that product, and getting it to them. 
So just um, putting some emphasis on the understanding and remembering that that's how we define market and where it got started. So there's this kind of reveals and leads us into a discussion about two, basically two approaches to marketing. One would be called production driven marketing, which is to say push marketing. And the other would be market driven production, um, which is to say pull marketing. And we can basically divide all marketing into these two categories. Production driven marketing, the basic logic behind that is we make this stuff, it's good stuff and you should buy it. So as marketers, we're pushing our product onto the marketplace. They're not asking for it. We're just saying, hey, we make it, we think it's good and you ought to buy it. So our objective becomes persuading consumers, educating them and trying to convince them to try what we have and then buy it. So that's production driven or push marketing. On the other hand, you have market driven or pull marketing. In this case, people want this stuff. Consumers are really standing around saying, I wish that this product existed. If I could find it, I would buy it, right? They will buy the product. And so your marketing objective mainly becomes letting people know that you exist and that you have the stuff. It's a, it's a much more uh, efficient or much easier task to take on when you're in a poll position. If we compare the two, we could think about some examples of how you go about your communication plan with market-driven versus production-driven. You can also think about the implications uh, that, that these different kinds of marketing have on the product's price and our marketing cost. In a poll situation, you can pretty much name your price, command the price that you want because people are seeking out this product already. But in a push situation, you're going to be offering discounts and coupons and free, free samples and such, which is going to hurt your market price. Likewise, your marketing costs, of course, would be much higher in production driven because you're taking a lot of time and energy to push the product out on the market. There are some examples of pull marketing, both from the local foods world and not. Um, there was a time when farms with vegetable CSAs didn't have a winter CSA and when there weren't winter, winter farmers markets. And we really had consumers quite literally saying, I wish there was a place that I could buy fresh local produce or fresh local, local food during the winter. And so these things were created in response to that poll. Another you know, kind of fun example is the iPhone. Um, this picture is, is real. It's from Boston when the newest version of the iPhone was coming out. People went and camped on the sidewalk. So that's an example of poll marketing. The consumer is pulling this product into the marketplace. And we think about what Apple has to do when they launch the new phone. They really need to say, it's here, we have it. And that's their whole objective. They don't need to offer huge discounts. They don't need to push the product or do any convincing because it's already being pulled into the marketplace. Some examples of push marketing that are kind of fun is just to think about those common brands that need to reinvent themselves from time to time and stay in the consumer's mind. So at one point, Crest Toothpaste came out with this 3D white advanced vivid, and it, you know, it makes you laugh, right? They're pushing this on the market because no consumer said, oh, I wish my teeth were 3D white. Um, same with Tide with ActiLift. You know, ActiLift is a, is a magic ingredient that gets stains out of your clothing well people expected Tide to do that anyway. So, um, you know, that was really push marketing to introduce a new version of Tide. And you can think about how these brands go about launching these new products. They do it with, with coupons and free samples. Um, with laundry detergent, you know, it's funny. You can, they're so desperate to get their new versions out. They'll mail a pouch of laundry detergent to your house and they'll mail it to you know, every house in the U.S. So that's really push, push, push uh, when you're mailing your product out for free to people's homes. In the local fo foods world, I tried to think of an example and I came up with Kaleette, which is a cross between Brussels sprouts and kale, and it forms these little tiny Brussels sprout-sized heads of kale. And again, 
Um, no consumer was saying, oh man, I, I wish they crossed Brussels sprouts with kale, right? So it was, it was never being pulled into the market, even though each of those vegetables on their own were very popular. Um, so the way that the rollout for this new crop went was that seed companies were mailing free seed for kale out to farms just to get them to try it. That's a push. And then some of the farms that I know that, that actually grew kale in turn were ended up sampling and even giving it away to their, to their best customers because um, there was no demand and they needed to push the product out there. So there's just some fun examples of what, uh, how that works. So what's important with push during versus pull is that it has, as marketers who are busy and have production farm to operate, we all really want to make sure that we're not in a position where we're trying to push our product because of the extra time and expense and really inefficiency that comes with the push market. You might be asking, well, what about for the crops or the products, the meats that I produce now? Um, the way to manage that is to identify the consumers who currently want what you produce. Uh, in other words, you're going to do some market research to find the consumers where you are in a pull situation. So some with some population or some segment of the market, there is a pull and that's probably who needs to be your target market. Some of the things that you'll work on with your market research are where are these people? Um, how many of them are there to get a sense of the size of your market? How can I best reach them and where? And what message will resonate with them? So this is part of like we discussed in the last section of developing the target audience and understanding them, we're furthering that into market research so we can quantify and get some direction about where and what to say. Second important concept is with market research is that it helps us understand where they are and who they are. So market research helps us market our products to, do, to those who already value them. In other words, to keep our products and our farm in a pull market. This is much more efficient than push market. And what about consumer education? Because really educating the consumer is expensive and it takes a lot of time and has a, a slow effect on the market. Um, I don't think that farms should be engaged in let's say convincing consumers about the value of say local or, or organic or grass fed or anything like that. That's not really for the farm. The farm should be finding the people who already value those things. But some consumer education, of course, does make sense. And for that, we would look for a nonprofit groups like NC Choices and, and Cooperative Extension and so on to work with the consumer and uh, teach them the value of local. And here are some other organizations that are helping um, educate consumers about the value of farm products in our state. So it's not to say that consumer education is inherently a bad idea. It's just that it's not the place for the farm because we don't have the, the resources to get it done effectively. You can also conduct your own market research if you already have a customer base. You can look at basic rates like customer uh, dollars per customer transaction. So when people shop with me, how much are they spending each time they buy? And that's a rate that you could begin to work on uh, once you have some research on it, some baseline data. Looking at the number of people that shop with you per hour if you're at a market. Just looking at your best and your worst selling items by keeping some records and some inventory. Um, looking at the pricing and the descriptions that other vendors are using. You know, folks often ask me, what's the, what's the new trend in local meat? And um, to a certain degree, I'm gonna find what the new trend is by looking around in the marketplace. Grocery stores and restaurants are probably just a little bit behind, so, but I could still learn from them. But I also might look at the farmer's markets and in some publications and frankly, in Facebook groups and conversations that I can find online. You can also survey your customers and really having conversations with them and asking them, well-designed um, questions will count as market research as well. Anything that's going to inform you about what's happening in the market and how you can better respond and remain in that whole market position. 
So uh, some summary on market research is that um, ultimately it can inform your marketing, of course, but you might even want to consider adapting your production in order to meet consumer demand. Um, think about making changes to production when it is both reasonable and profitable. I'll give you this great example, a real, a real world example. I was speaking with a farm, a farmer who was selling all of their beef by quarters and halves. And while they had been doing well and they had been growing year to year, um, the farmer said that he was concerned because it's such a big check for people to write uh, when they make that purchase. And, um, you know, so that's something that he saw as a limitation for growth, people having to write that one big, big check all at once. <clears throat> well, we talked about some ways that he could address that concern through marketing. Um, but we also continued the conversation and he went on to say that he was very proud of the really heavy carcass weights that he was getting on his cattle. So his animals were hanging at 850 or 900 pounds or even heavier sometimes. And that's where I said, well, there's an opportunity to start adapting your production in order to better serve your customer, right? Bring that frame size down because the customer's paying on hanging weight. Right? Bring that carcass size down so it's not such a big check and such a big commitment. That's an example of marketing, uh, understanding your consumer, doing your research, and later making changes even to your production system. Um, just some uh, summary points. You can always use this market research to keep your product in the market-driven space. So um, as far as a to-do list goes, we talked about um, marketing strategy in the first section and, and how to get started working on that by creating a strategy sentence. And now we're going to talk about what to do uh, sitting around the kitchen table and having your marketing meeting. And that is to conduct research into the market to un inform your consumer understanding and the way that you represent your product in the market.